rail cars. Some of us see them every day, and while they can be interesting sometimes, there usually ain't too much going for them. That's because all we're seeing is just average everyday rolling stock. But what about the obscure, experimental, or specialty stuff? The rail cars at the bottom of the iceberg that can carry thousands of gallons of molten metal or start World War III. Get ready to learn all about these and much more as we go over 10 obscure rail cars in 10 minutes. Let's start off small with the scale test car. These little rail cars are kept at a very specific weight, usually anywhere from 25 to 50 tons, and are used to calibrate loading scales. Coal, grain, wood chips, and much more is all measured and shipped by weight, so the scales that measure these goods as they're being loaded or received must be very precise to ensure no money is lost, and it's scale test cards that help keep these weighing devices in line. It's important that STCs ain't handled too rough, because it could throw off their precise weight. If you ever see a scale test car in transit, it'll usually be at the end of a train or on a flat car, just to keep it from being shaken around too much. However, some scale test cars will be disguised as typical pieces of rolling stock, such as hoppers or box cars, so keep your eyes peeled for them. Stepping it up a notch size-wise, we take a look at single bay whale belly hoppers. These interesting rail cars came out in the late 60s and were used by railroads such as the CB&Q, BN, SCL, and CSX. Their purpose was to haul dry bulk commodities such as plastic pellets, sugar, flour, cement mix, you name it. While they look like a typical gravity hopper from the outside, they actually have quite a complex unloading system. Inside is a labyrinth of air ducts that operates at 50 to 80 psi. Now, it was basically impossible to find any information on just how this unloading system works, but I imagine it either works similarly or exactly like an air slide hopper's unloading system, where air is used to fluidize the cargo so it can simply flow out the bottom. Several of these whale belly hoppers survive today, hauling cement mix for dragging cement up in Maine. Speaking of whale bellies, I give you the whale belly tanker, the largest tank car ever made. Just like the whale belly hoppers, this gargantuan tank car was made in the late 60s. It can hold a staggering 60,000 gallons, which is roughly twice the capacity of even the biggest tank cars you see today. The aptly nicknamed rail whale was made by GATX as an experiment and was supposed to haul substances such as anhydrous ammonia or liquefied petroleum gas. However, this behemoth never even saw revenue service because at 97 foot long, it was simply too big to be reliably used, and in 1971, it was donated to the National Transportation Museum in St. Louis, Missouri, where it still resides today. Because the rail whale was such a massive failure, and the FRA was starting to regulate the length of rail cars, it ended up being the only one ever made. Instead of making rail cars as obnoxiously large as possible, what if you shortened them and daisy-chained them together? Well, that's exactly what Santa Fe did with their fleet of super hoppers. In the early 90s, Santa Fe sought to make grain transportation even more efficient, so they had three of these articulated hoppers built, and boy did they work great. They were extremely lightweight due to their aluminum construction, and carried 30% more grain than five normal hoppers combined, which saved thousands on fuel costs. However, loading and unloading them was cumbersome due to each hopper's shortened length but that didn't stop them from being used. All three super hoppers would continue to see revenue service until 2017, when they were finally retired after 26 years on the rails. Even though two were scrapped, one remains in preservation at the Oklahoma Railway Museum and is set to be restored. Speaking of efficiency, let me introduce you to Southern Pacific's Verta Pack Auto Racks. It's the late 60s and Chevy is designing the Vega a car meant to cost no more than two grand. However, shipping the Vegas from the factory to the Pacific coast by typical means would be too costly, making for an inflated price out west. So SP and GM got together and designed the VertiPack, a rail car specifically made for carrying Chevy Vegas long distances. While normal auto racks could only carry 18 cars, these could carry 30, which slashed shipping costs. Because the Vegas were shipped upright, 
Fill ports and reservoirs for the car's fluids had to be moved, so all the liquid stayed contained. And oil baffles were added to keep the engine from flooding, along with several other modifications. But after the Vega was discontinued, SP scrapped all the vertipacks, since they were too niche to be used for anything else. On the topic of niche, purpose-built rolling stock, let's take a look at torpedo cars. These very strange rail cars carry many tons of molten pig iron around foundries and steel mills, and come in a wide variety of sizes. Inside, they're lined with thick, heavy-duty refractory insulation to prevent damage to the car's outer shell and keep the metal hot. They must be preheated and completely dry before receiving any molten metal, but once they're loaded, these cars can hold that molten metal for hours at a time. Unloading a torpedo car is quite interesting. Usually, cars are anchored in some way, and the whole torpedo rotates to dump its molten contents. The cars must be anchored, because when the torpedo rotates, it drastically changes the car's center of gravity, which risks derailment. Over the years, torpedo car designs haven't changed much, and they're still widely used today. Now, let's take a look at the biggest revenue service box cars ever made. These hogshead tobacco cars were designed to compete with the trucking industry and bring tobacco back to the rails. They operate off the same principle as a super hopper and rail whale, where bigger equals more efficient. One car carried roughly 100 hogsheads of tobacco and had 10,000 cubic feet of capacity with a super cushion frame for smooth riding. They were so big that even with the 10-foot doors wide open, they were still too dimly lit inside, so each one came with several skylights for better internal visibility. Tobacco wasn't all these giants carried, because they were well suited to haul any lightweight bulk commodity you could think of, like cotton, furniture, tires, etc. Southern was the only railroad to build these monsters, and while several were used on NS, they were eventually taken off the roster and scrapped. Thankfully, at least one survived. It's on display in Bramwell, West Virginia. Also, did you know a boxcar could be turned into a caboose? Because that's exactly what happened with Great Northern X-181, better known as the Hutch. This one-of-a-kind king-size caboose started life in 1924 as a 50-foot boxcar and was rebuilt into this Frankenstein in early 1953, specifically for use on rural branch lines. The Hutch was put to work on the Hutchison Local in central Minnesota for many, many years. It doubled as both a caboose and boxcar, using its massive storage compartment to haul LCLs, or less than carload orders from the route's various businesses. And to make things even cooler, this unique caboose was almost always pulled by an equally unique NW5. Eventually, though, the Hutch was taken off the Local and later taken out of service altogether sometime in the 70s or 80s. Today, it sits in Devil's Lake, North Dakota, living a new life as part of a sports bar. Now, let's look at one of the most imposing boxcars out there. This is a Peacemaker Rail Garrison, and its sole purpose was to carry and launch an MGM 118A Peacemaker ICBM. These mobile launch sites were dreamed up in the late 80s as a result of the Cold War, and would be just one part of an elaborate pre-made train set. The plan was to have 25 trains with two missiles each stationed around the country at various military bases, and at the drop of a hat, these missile trains would enter the U.S. rail network all at once, making it nearly impossible for the Soviets to pinpoint where our ICBMs were. The missile train and their 42-man crews were very meticulously planned out and tested, but just as the trains were getting ready to be made in mass, the Cold War ended. This lone rail garrison prototype is only one of two ever made, and since 1994, it's been on public display at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. Of course, a video about obscure rail cars wouldn't be complete without the largest rail car in the world. This is WECX-801, a Schnabel car purpose-built for hauling immensely heavy, oversized cargo. Unloaded, it's over 230 foot long, and with the right cargo, it can be as long as a football field. This is because a Schnabel's load is carried in between the two huge lifting arms, so the length of the car changes with what's being carried. And if certain cargo can't support a structural load, a giant bridge will be installed for it to rest on. WECX-801 also has an elaborate hydraulic system that allows it to shift its cargo at low speeds in order to avoid obstructions. And because of this thing's size, it has a max speed of only 25 miles per hour empty 
and 15 miles per hour loaded. If you want to learn more about Schnabels and all their intricacies, I have a video all about them. The link's in the description. Now, there are plenty more obscure rail cars out there, and we'd be here till next Tuesday if we tried to cover each and every one. But hopefully I was able to shed some light on at least some of the world's lesser known rolling stock. If you know of any exceptionally strange rail cars that weren't mentioned in this video, please tell us in the comments. Thanks for watching. If y'all enjoyed this video, consider checking out some other ones of mine. Also, maybe pass yourself by the merch shop. Anyways, till next time.